I want to welcome all of you to this special event tonight, You Gotta Believe, featuring our special guest speaker, George Shin. This is a special athletics event as part of our ETSU Centennial Celebration and also a keynote event in our Athletics Department Student Services Life Skills Program. All of our student athletes and many of our coaches are here tonight and we want to welcome you all uh, to this event. Our thanks to Barb Mason for making the arrangements for the event and to Sarah Hacker, our marketing coordinator, for inviting many student groups across campus to share this with us tonight. I know that we have uh, several students from the ETSU 1000 classes. We appreciate you being here. Uh, we invited and I think we have present several sports management majors, uh, students from the Honors College, uh, fraternities and sororities, business and marketing students, uh, ROTC and student government organization. So welcome to all of you. Several members of our Buccaneer Athletic Scholarship Association Board of Directors are here with their spouses and we welcome you all tonight also. There are other members of the community and uh, we're glad that you have joined us. <clears throat> also joining us tonight uh, is Mr. Shen's wife, Denise, and we appreciate her being here. She plays a major role in the foundation projects, uh, the George Shen Foundation, and we appreciate uh, her support and being here tonight. Just a couple of brief announcements. Tonight's event, uh, the Tails and Tailgate event, which is a pregame event for uh, donors and fans and sponsors prior to the game on Saturday, and the game itself are all uh, made possible through the generosity and friendship of George and Denise Shin. And so this is a week of, of a lot of activities and we appreciate them helping to make all of this possible. Immediately following uh, the event in the auditorium tonight, uh, Mr. Shin will be in the lobby to sign copies of his two best-selling books, You Gotta Believe and The Miracle of Motivation. And we'll have those uh, for sale and he is donating the proceeds uh, of that to, to our project uh, this week. We'll also have NBA tickets for the game on sale and we've arranged a special discounted student price through a partnership with 112 Grill downtown and uh, those tickets will be available for anyone who, who would like to purchase those. <clears throat> Tonight uh, you'll have the unique opportunity to hear George Shen's story. As you know, there are very few people in the world who own an NBA franchise or an NFL or Major League Baseball team. To have one of them living right here in our community and becoming involved in our community, in our athletic program at ETSU is even rarer. A successful businessman, George Shen founded and has been the sole majority owner of the Hornets since their inception in 1988 in Charlotte and their move to New Orleans in 2002. He received his formal education from a small business school in his home state of North Carolina, but he holds five honorary doctorates from universities across the country. At the age of 34, George was the youngest person ever to be presented the prestigious Horatio Alger Award, which recognizes rags to riches people who achieve success while maintaining values in patriotism, faith, and civic involvement. The author of five books on leadership development, sales, and motivation, Mr. Shen has consistently proven an ability to overcome tremendous odds in order to reach his goals. He has been committed to, con to the continued growth and revitalization of New Orleans and the surrounding areas since the Hurricane Katrina catastrophe, while also working to bring an NBA championship to the state of Louisiana. He has been recognized and thanked 
for his many efforts in numerous ways, one in particular by New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin, who presented him with the Quiet Hero Award. The Shen Foundation has generated over $4 million to aid in the recovery throughout New Orleans and the state. More than 50,000 lives have been touched by the Shen's Season of Giving holiday initiatives in, in Louisiana. The Hornets Hoops for Homes initiative was created by the foundation directly following Hurricane Katrina to rebuild homes in the New Orleans community. To date, the project has impacted funding and repairs for over 65 families uh, in the New Orleans area. His efforts, along with the commitment from players, coaches, and staff to take an active role off the court while providing world-class entertainment and success on the court have been immeasurable and something for the entire state of Louisiana to rally around. For a lifetime of achievement in business and higher education, Mr. Shen was one of 12 to receive an America Success Award from President Bush in a White House ceremony. Since buying property and spending time in this area, George and Denise have become very active members of our community, of the Boones Creek Christian Church, and have reached out to many organizations like ours. Please join me in welcoming the owner of the New Orleans Hornets, Mr. George Shen. How is everybody? Good, good. I will try to keep my remarks uh, not quite as long as my introduction, and, uh, but I appreciate all the kind remarks that uh, uh, Coach Mullen said. It's a pleasure to be here to see all the young faces and and uh, energetic people that uh, I'm sure you're excited about this new school year. And, and if you're an athlete, I'm, I hope you're excited about your coming season, what you're gonna be doing. But before I get started with my remarks, I'd like to uh, just tell you a simple, couple simple little stories about myself. I mean, uh, Coach Mullins mentioned all the positive things and things that has been accomplished. He, fortunately, uh, they don't say all the bad things and the negative things. But what I'd like to do is just to share with you that during my life, I've had a lot of difficult situations, unfortunate problems, and through it all, I, I gained a tremendous amount of experience. I don't have a whole lot of education. Uh, I got my education through working hard and falling, getting scratched up, getting hurt, getting up and going again. And I have to share with you a little, little story about my, how good of what kind of outstanding student I was in, in school. I graduated from high school uh, back in 1900 and whoa, whoa. And uh, surprised you on that one, eh? But uh, when I graduated, it was in a little town in North Carolina called Kannapolis. It was famous for cannon mill products. And there was one high school, and they had 232 graduates that year. That's pretty big for a little country town. And I recall when I graduated, I had the distinct honor out of 232 graduates, graduating 232. So I share that with you. I just want you to know that I struggled all my life. I struggled in high school. And, but I had a mom that really loved me, that cared about me, and that continued to motivate me. She encouraged me to do everything I could with my life and always was there to paint a great picture no matter what the story was. 
Let's see if Coach Mullins has got it fixed. He said he was told it was working. He's already casting the blame, right? <laughs> The light is not green. Now it's green. I'll walk away from that. We'll try this. I'd rather stand out here. Now is it working? Okay, good, good. But I have to share with you about my mom because when I graduated, she had a goal for me when I was in high school. And there were five of us in the family, five children, and my mom had a goal for me. Very simple goal. She wanted me to graduate from high school. Now that shouldn't be a hard job for a person to graduate from high school. So I turned out to be a pretty lousy student. There were a lot of things more important to me. Athletics was one of them nice cars and pretty girls. So I didn't study very hard in school and that's the reason I graduated last in my high school class. But I can remember we had a banquet at the school cafeteria in Kannapolis and each student was to bring their parents. My dad had died when I was eight years old, and unfortunately, my dad didn't have money. And we, my mom and I had to live with the help of welfare, free lunches in school, and hand-me-down clothes. So I want you to know that I've been there. I know what it's like to struggle. I know what it's like to hurt and to need. But I recall that function, that dinner we had at high school, to show you what kind of mom I had that was always there to inspire me. Uh, we, we, we came in together, my mom and I. And the school cafeteria, I can remember, had a real high ceiling. And it was a pretty big room. It's a pretty big high school. And, so, and we came in and the principal uh, talked to us. But when we came in, they had all the names of the graduates on the wall. Now, nobody called me and asked, George, how would you like for us to list these names? Had somebody done that, I would have suggested we do it in alphabetical order. But they listed them based on rank. So you know where my name was, right? It was right at the bottom. And I'll, I'll remember to the day I die that my mom, when we came in, she was looking for my name. It was kind of hidden because it was that far from the floor, right on the bottom. And my mom, bless her heart, she's in heaven now, but she went down, she got down on one knee, and she started rubbing my name like this. Embarrassed me to death. I mean, all my classmates said, look at that dumb woman over there. George is on the bottom, and she's down there rubbing his name. And I said, Mom, what are you doing? You're embarrassing me to death. You did fix it, Dave. <laughs> said, you embarrass me to death. What are you doing? I said, I'm on the bottom. I graduated last, Mom. Don't embarrass me. I remember she stood up. She looked me square in the eyes. She said, boy, don't you pull yourself down. You didn't graduate last. You are the foundation to your graduating class. You are holding everybody else up. <laughs> now, how in the world can a guy fail when he's got a mom like that? I'll tell you one other quick story. The first steak, the first steak I ever ate in my life was at a football banquet. And I recall as a young boy that we ate a lot of hamburger. And I can remember one story that a close friend of mine, they used to grill steaks out in their yard, backyard, frequently. And I remember one night they asked me if I would stay and have a steak with them. 
and I said, no, Mom's already fixed dinner, and I need to go home, and I need to be with Mom tonight. So I went home, and when I got there, we had hamburger meat. And I remember, Mom, why in the world? Our neighbors always have steaks, and we have hamburger meat. Why in the world can't we afford steaks? And my mom said, son, don't pull down our neighbors just because they can't afford to have their meat ground up. <laughs> so she always took a negative and turned it to a positive. She was just full of inspiration, always giving me hope, telling me, I don't care what happens to you. I don't care where you are in this life. All you have to do to move up another notch in your life is to take that step, to believe in yourself. God granted you the ability to be anybody you want to be and to do anything you want to do. And you know, I got to believe in that. I got to believe in that. You see, we all can accomplish more in our life than we want to. And I struggle through school but I've been very blessed in my business career because I followed these simple little principles that my mom taught me when I was growing up. And I want to share those with you. And a lot of these things you probably heard from your own parents or teachers or friends. And I'm telling you, these little simple things can not only help you become a better student, they can help you become a better athlete, they can help you become a better human being when you get married, a better parent, a better spouse, just a better human being. Because there's simple, simple things that's taught not only by good teachers, but it's the teaching also of the Bible. So my talk is you got to believe. So let me share with you what I want you to try to get from my remarks tonight. You've got to believe. You've got to believe. Point number one, and you've got to believe, you've got to have a good attitude. You've got to think positive thoughts. I mean, particularly you guys, if you're an athlete, and if you don't think you've got a chance to win, do you think you're going to win? You know you're not. If you don't go out with a positive attitude to believe that you can accomplish something, that you're going to be at your best, you're going to do your best, then you won't. You just won't. You see, teams don't always win because they have the tallest guy or the fastest guy or the quickest person or the sharpest this or the fastest that. It doesn't always work that way. The people that have the right attitudes that are just oozing with confidence usually are the people in the teams that wins. Self-confidence. Believing. Have confidence in yourself. There's a story that I recall uh, a man that became very successful in the in food business years ago and he got started off at a grocery store working in the produce section but he had a great attitude his name was Ralph Kettner, and I remember a story about him when he was uh, working at the grocery store. I'll have to back up a little bit and tell the story of this man that came to the grocery store. And the guy had been out working all day. When he got home, his wife told him to go to the grocery store, and he was going to watch a game on TV. And she said, go to the grocery store and get me a half a head of lettuce. Well, he said, honey, I'm going to watch. And she said, no, you're not. You're going to the grocery store, and you're going to get me a half head of lettuce and bring it back. I'm going to fix dinner. Well, he didn't like the idea, but he went on to the grocery store, and he was upset. So he got to the grocery store, and he started looking in the produce section, and all he saw was just a full head of lettuce. So he asked somebody, and he was upset because his wife pushed him to come, said, uh, I would like to have a half head of lettuce. 
and the produce gal that was there said, sir, I'm sorry, we don't, we don't have a half head of lettuce. Well, he got upset and said, look, my wife sent me here to get a half head of lettuce, and I'm not leaving until I get it. So she got the uh, uh, produce manager, he came up, and he tried to explain to the guy, said, sir, we don't, we don't make a half head of lettuce. We don't have a half head of lettuce. We have small heads of lettuce. We have big and medium size. I'm sorry, you just buy a head of lettuce and cut it in half when you get home. He said, I came here to get a half head of lettuce, and I'm not leaving until I get it. Well, Ralph was there, Ralph Kettner, this young guy that built a huge chain of grocery stores, and Ralph came up, and he said, sir, let me go see if I can help you. I walked down here and see the manager. So he walked to the end of the store, and the guy was upset looking for the half head of lettuce falling. Well, he didn't know he was falling. He walked up to the manager's door, and he was sitting in the chair. He said, sir, there's some dumb, stupid idiot at the front of the store that wants to buy a half a head of lettuce. And he turned around, he saw the guy standing there, and he said, and this gentleman wants the other half. Pretty good thinker, huh? You see, we all come upon situations that we fall, we make mistakes, we do dumb things. But he thought quickly and recovered from a, a remark that was very embarrassing. So think positive. We all can do that. And we all have to have an attitude about everything we do, about your training, about yourself, about your abilities, about the way you look, about the way you feel. But if you have a bad attitude, if you don't think you can compete, if you don't think that you're capable, if you don't think all the bad things, then that's where you are. You've got to move yourself to that level by thinking positive thoughts. Point number one, I'm going to give you a test when we're done. Uh, part number one is to, what did I just say? You've got to think positive. Okay. Point number two, you got to put mistakes behind you, okay? We all make mistakes. We all do crazy things from time to time. Some people make mistakes and it pulls them down the rest of their lives. They can't get over it. If you make a mistake, what we need to do every time we do something wrong is we put it where it belongs. We put it right back here. We put it behind us. We try to gain from the mistake we made. We forget it. And if you have any faith at all, you ask God to forgive you. And God forgives you. It's forgotten forever. All you have to do is ask. So if He forgives you, you're forgiven. Forget it. Put it behind you and gain from the mistake that you made. Become a better person, become stronger, and it'll help you grow in all the things that you do. All right, point number one is to you got to think positive. Point number two, you got to put mistakes behind you. All right, point number three. Get this wire out of the way here. Point number three, you've got to set goals. You've got to set goals. I want you to think about it. Let me see basketball players in here. Raise your hands. Hey, I'm impressed. Front row here. Good, guys. We have the, where's the ladies? Back here, I see some legs in the air, too. Okay, great, great. Let me give you an example about goals. I want you to think about before you have a game. And the game's to start at 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock, I don't care what time, but the game's going to start. And the fans are there to watch, and you run out on the court, and all of a sudden you look up and you're dribbling, you're getting ready to look, looking for the hoop so you can shoot, and there's not one there. I mean, think about 
what's the fans going to think about? There's no goal. And you ask somebody, well, how, how can you play a basketball game? You don't have a goal. You don't have anything to shoot for. You don't have a way to score. You know, life's the same way. I had to have goals in my life. I had to have a target to shoot for. And once you write down that goal to improve yourself, whether it's to score better, whether it's to defend better, whether it's to work harder, whether it's to help your teammates by giving them more assists, I don't care what it is. Write down what you want to do with your life. I don't care if it's to make all A's. I never accomplished that goal. But I want you to just think about writing down what you want to do with your life. What you're doing, you're starting off, you're putting down a road map of what you want to do. You want to set goals. So when you do shoot, you got your eye on the target. You got your eye on the target. And that's the key thing to do. And if you come to the game Saturday night and you see any of the guys, whether they're playing for the Hawks or the Hornets, one thing you'll know for sure whenever they're shooting, particularly if they're shooting for three-point shot, where are their eyes? On the goal, right? Keep your eyes on your goal. Don't take your eyes off your target. Obstacles, if you look the other way, you're going to fail. You're going to stumble. Focus on your target. Another quick little story. When I was growing up, my closest friend, he was killed in an accident when he was 29 years old, and that was a long time ago. But he was an unusual guy, very bright, huge guy. I mean, not just big, he was fat. And uh, I mean fat. When he was, I, I remember this so vividly because when he was 13, he weighed 313. That's a big dude, huh? And, but he was so unusual. He was very bright, and he was, very, he was a incredible dancer. He was a great athlete, and just, it's unbelievable, this guy that fat. And I recall... We got in an argument because at the time, I think I weighed about 135 and he weighed 335 or somewhere thereabouts. And we got to talking about who was more agile, who was more graceful. Can you believe a little guy like me at that time, a lot thinner than I am now, and a big fat guy, which one of the two would be a little bit more agile or graceful? Well, we decided that we were going to do a little bet. Now, this was many years ago, and we came up with what we would do to see who was the most graceful. And here's what we came up with. Close to the school that we went to, attended, there was railroad tracks. We agreed that we would meet there that next morning and then what we were going to do was get on the rail of the railroad track and see who could walk the fathers without falling. You ever tried it? Seriously, have you ever tried that? I mean, it's not easy. Try it sometime. But anyway, and I never tried that. I said, well, this fat guy can't beat me. So we agreed, and he said, uh, well, let's make it interesting. He said, I'll bet you 10 bucks. Can you get 10 bucks? Well, I, I said, I will get $10 somehow. Now, what I did, I borrowed $10 from my mom. She didn't know it. Uh, <laughs> true story, I slipped in her handbag and, got, and I wrote a little note and told her I was going to bring back 20 And uh, But anyway, we met the next day. And I'll never forget this. Big fat Glenn came up, and uh, I was there waiting on him. He said, you got your money, shorty? And I said, yes, sir, I got, you got yours, fatty. He said, yep. So he said, how you want to do this? I said, your call. He said, well, what we'll do, let's just, we'll start right here. I'll stand right here, and you start here, and you walk as far as you can. I'll go first, and you can go. He's giving me the option. He's a nice guy. He said, and you go as far as you can. 
and when you have to get off, wherever you fall off, you stop right there. And if I can't get to you, I owe you the money. If I walk past you, you owe me the money. And uh, so we agreed, and, and he let me go first. I'll never forget this. And, and I got there a little early. The reason I got there a little early, I wanted to practice. And I thought, I said, I'm going to kill this fat guy. So anyway, I got on this thing, and I was walking. I was keeping my eye on my foot to make sure I was not going to fall. And finally, I don't know how far I walked. This was a long time ago. It wasn't far. And I finally slipped off. He said, whoa, that's it. No farther. He said, now, hold your $10 up in your hand because I'm going to get it when I walk by. All right, fatty, come on. You won't believe what happened. This fat dude started walking. I mean, he was just like he was sashaying down the street, like to walk around. He grabbed my 10 bucks. I said, man, I can't believe this. How in the world were you able to do this? Now, I want you to listen to his story, why, and I want you to learn from it. Because I talked to you about obstacles, and I talked to you about keeping focus on your target, okay? He said, George, it's very simple. You see, when you were walking, you kept looking down. You didn't have a goal. You were looking at your feet, and you stumbled over them. He said, I can't see my feet. So I had a goal out here. I focused on my goal, and my goal was beyond you. And so I started walking toward my goal. He said, and my feet was following me to my target, just like when you shoot a basketball, and if your eye's on the target, you're going to hit it. If you take your eye off, you know your coaches would tell you you're going to miss. Keep focused. Keep focused. You've got to do the same thing and goals with your life. You just got to do that. All right, point number one is you got to be positive. Point number two, you got to put mistakes behind you. Point number three, you got to set goals. And the final point to me is probably the most important of all, and is you got to believe. Now, I'm going to preach to you a little bit, but I want to make sure you understand, and I want you to try to grasp this because if you want to have a successful career and a lot of you might some of you might make it in the professional sports world some of you might make it in some other type of career that brings you a lot of revenues and a lot of money but a lot of people have to work real hard to earn a good living and I'm just saying that if you follow certain principles and if you believe it's amazing how it can change not just your attitude but the attitude of the people that you're serving or the people you're working for. And that's very simple. To me, when we talk about believing, it's very important for you to believe in what you're doing right now. Believe in this university because it's an outstanding, wonderful university. You can gain so much knowledge from it. But if you come here with an attitude of non-belief that I don't believe I'm going to make it, then you're not going to make it. Shore up your attitude. Start thinking positive and do better than I did in school. And that won't be hard. So just work a little bit harder and believe. Have confidence. And if somebody asks you where you go to college, where you go to, which university you go to, I mean, don't just whisper. Shout it out. Let people know how proud you are. That just changes everybody's attitude. Show pride in what you do. So when you get involved in a career, you show pride in the community. You show pride in the people you are working for. And you have a lot of confidence and pride in this country. I know with all the problems we're having, trust me, I've been all over the world, this is the greatest place in the world to be. United States of America. This is the only place, and I promise you this, I promise, this is the only place in the world that a man 
could have a dream to own an NBA team and accomplish that dream. Only in America could that happen. And a guy that graduated last in his class. You see, it can happen. Dreams do come true, but you have to put a little muscle behind those dreams. So you got to believe. You have got to believe. You got to believe in yourself. Now think about that. How important is it for you to believe in yourself? It's so important. I mean, if you don't have confidence in yourself, how do you expect anybody else to have confidence in you? You've got to believe in yourself. Just keep telling yourself, I can do this. I can accomplish this. I'm strong. I can do anything I want to do. Believe in yourself. And I want you to understand that since the beginning of time, there have been billions of people, billions, to walk the face of this earth. And there never has been, and there never will be, another you. Now think about that. What that means is that God created you special. You're that special. Nobody has ever or ever will be the same as you. You're that unique and that special. So you be proud of who you are because God made you and He makes no mistakes. Believe in yourself and also believe in others. Now I want you to think about this. In basketball, I don't care how strong any one of you gents are or you ladies. The way you achieve success is as a team, playing together. And each one of you know the other's abilities, strengths, capabilities, problems, errors, everything else. And your brain will start telling you, now this is the time I pass the ball to her or to him, or this is the time I pass by her or him. You'll learn that. You'll know that. But one thing you need to know, whether it's in sports or in your personal life, you're going to need other people for you to accomplish your goals in life. Now, I want you to think about it. We all need others to help us get to where we want to, whether it's winning a basketball game or another sporting event or whether it's to succeed in a business career or a job where you want to just make some money. You need help. You need others to help you. And you know, if you think about it, the more people you have helping you, the better off you are. Because, you see, the more people you have lifting you, saying good things about you, patting you on the back, giving you a little shove, encouraging you, the more you have lifting you up, the higher you go. Okay? So you need to have confidence in yourself. You also need to believe in other people, and you need to work with other people. And the final key, I'll tell you one more story, and I'm out of here, is that the most important thing in my life has been my relationship with God. Now, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not going to preach. I'm going to tell you one story that taught me an incredible lesson. But we all make mistakes and we all do things we shouldn't do. But there's nothing stronger. And I'll, I'll close out with that. But I want to tell you a story that, that uh, happened to me as a young father and a much younger man in my life. Uh, we had purchased a home on the beach. This was probably 30, more than 30 years ago. And after we bought the house, I had no clue of how the salt air would damage stuff at a home or a car or whatever. I mean, the salt air, if you leave a car out alone, I mean, things are going to start falling off of it because of the rust. Well, we had a house that the screens started rusting, doors started warping. I just, I just couldn't believe it, so, and, it, and we built it new. So I asked around for a guy that might be able to help me. 
and somebody recommended uh, a guy that he said, look, he's a nice guy. He's not educated, but he's a wonderful human being. You can trust him, and he's really good at what he does. So I called him. We set it up. He was coming the next day, and and uh, I had to go out and buy a new door, and, and so I went to Kmart's. This was years ago. I don't know if they still have the blue light specials, but they had one then. I remember I've got, I bought a $5 ladder. You can imagine how strong it was. And I bought a door. I took measurements myself. I measured the encasing part of the door so I could have this door ready for him when he came. And I bought some paint. He was going to do some painting. So he got there at the appointed hours, 8 o'clock that morning, ready to get started. And I showed him where the stuff was, and the ladder was outside to paint. And I recall it seemed like everything went wrong that day. He was outside painting, and it just started pouring rain. And I was upstairs, and I remember hearing a crash. I ran downstairs, and that ladder had collapsed, had his leg hung in it. I had to help pull his leg out of that cheap ladder I bought. And he was just so, now he said, look, he said, everything's all right. The paint is spilled. I, I've got some paint thinner. I can get that up. I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it, Mr. Shin. Well, I went back upstairs, and, and later I heard an electric saw, you know, that the buzz of an electric motor on a saw. And I said, what in the world is he sawing? So next thing I knew, the, I heard the saw stop. And then I heard, you know, the old manual saw, you know, pull a nose. Well, I, I heard that. I said, what in the world happened? So I walked downstairs. And I saw him with the manual saw. And I said, uh, what happened? I heard, uh, did, I heard you with, why aren't you, why aren't you using the electric saw? He said, well, the motor burned up on me, but I did bring this manual saw. It'll be all right. And I said, well, what are you sawing? He said, Mr. Shin, that door you uh, had ordered for me, he said, whoever ordered this must have been an idiot. I wasn't about to tell him I was the idiot that uh, took the measurements, but he said they ordered it too big, but don't worry, I can cut it down. It'll fit fine. Everything went wrong that day. He came. To, to leave, I gave him the check, and he walked out to his old ancient pickup, and I was standing at the door, and I heard him, oh, oh, oh. he was dead. He walked back up to the house. I met him at the door. He said, Mr. Chen, I'm so sorry. I, if you would do me a favor and drive me home, He said, I'll, I'll have my brother to bring me in the morning. And I'll get my old pickup out of your yard. And I said, that's fine. I'll be happy to. So we got in the car, and I started trying to pump him up. I, I said, this guy, everything went wrong with this guy today. I was trying to tell him, you know, we all have bad days. Don't worry about it. He said, well, turn at the next stop sign, turn right. You know, he was just giving me directions. He wasn't listening to me. So he, we finally pulled up at his house, a little, small, modest home. And I recall that his driveway was a dirt driveway. It had grass in the center and sand because we was that close to the beach for the pass of the tires. And he said, Mr. Shen, just pull up in the drive. said, I want you to meet my wife and children. I said, well, great. I'd like to do that. So I, I, crazy, pulled up in the driveway. He said, just pull right up at the porch. He said, I just added this little screen porch. Pull up next to the porch here. And we pulled up at the porch, and the house was on the right-hand side, which is the passenger side. We both got out of the car, and as I got out and walked around the front, he had gotten out, and there was a tree standing right next to him and the branches were hanging down right you have to duck to go under well he was standing there rubbing the leaves with his fingertips like i want you to listen to this now he was running his fingers through the leaves like this and i, I was trying to figure out what in the world's going on here 
And so all of a sudden, after he quit rubbing the leaves of the tree, he turned. First time all day he called me George. He said, come on in, George. I want you to meet my wife and family. So I walked in. I mean, it was a complete transformation. I couldn't believe it. His wife was at the stove cooking. I remember him walking over, picking her up, swinging her around. And that was quite a tussle. I want you to know that. And, uh, and I remember him saying, honey, I love you. And then all of a sudden he introduced her and said, George, this is my wife. He said, she is the light of my life. He said, I couldn't make it without her. I mean, girls, you all want somebody like that, right? I mean, it was just so touching. Then all of a sudden, this young girl, maybe she was eight years old, I, I don't recall, but she was young, came out of a room and ran up and grabbed her dad and just embraced him, and he picked her up, and he started just bragging on, telling me what a great student she was, how much he loved her, all the positive. And then all of a sudden, this little rug rat, this little boy come flying out of a room, and he got down on his knees. This boy jumped up in there, and he caught him. They fell on the floor, and just started wrestling. And, and I mean, I, I, it was just unbelievable. He introduced me to this kid and how much he loved his family. And then finally, uh, I said, you know, I'm going to have to leave. I appreciate it. It's great meeting you guys. He said, well, here, I'll walk you to the door. So we walked outside. And when we walked outside, I had to ask. I said, look. I don't, I don't understand what happened to you. Today, everything went wrong. I mean, the ladder, you collapsed, you fell, you got paint all over, you got it all over the drive, and then you saw burn up, your truck wouldn't crank, you got soaking wet in the rain. And when we came to this house, when you walked through the doors of this house, it was like a complete, transformation I said what happened he said well did you see right before I walked in did you see me rubbing the leaves on this tree here I said oh yeah yeah I did see that <laughs> and he said well George I want you to know he said this tree is my trouble tree I want you to think about this this is my trouble tree he said, every night when I come in, he said, I have problems. I have troubles. I have frustrations. I'm upset. And he said, every night I come in, I stop at that tree, and I hang all my troubles for that day on that tree. Every problem I have, every frustration I have, I leave them on that tree. And you know, in the morning, when I come back out to get my troubles, most of them are gone. And the ones that are still there are not near as big as they were the night before. I don't know about you, but that's one of the most powerful messages this guy's ever gotten in his life. I mean, here's a guy that didn't even have an education that taught me something about life. A trouble tree. Can you believe? You see, in what I've learned over the years, and that with a mom that continued to encourage me, I have a trouble tree. And my trouble tree is faith in God. Because, you see, I make mistakes every day. I have things that fall on me that that sometime I want to scream. But I have a trouble tree that will pick me up, lift me up, and carry me to victory. And with all the downtime and all the problems I've had, he's always been there for me, and he will always be there for you. Now, I'm not going to have an altar call, and I'm not going to have a collection. I just want you to know that that's what happened in my life. And I want to tell you something, that when I was your age, I don't mean your age, Dave, I mean student's age. But when I, was, when I was young, like you, 
My mom told me something. It took years for it to sink in, but it was always there. And I want to share this with you, and I'll be done. But I want you to remember it, please, because there will be a time in your night life when you know I might need this advice. This happened to me. But she said, son, in your life, you're going to have problems. You're going to have difficult days. You're going to have dark days. You're going to have days that you just can't hardly get up and go. You're going to hear things from a doctor that might tell you your health is horrible, that you're sick, that you've got problems. You might get fired from a job. You might lose a loved one that you so desperately love. You might even lose a child. It's all kinds of difficulties and problems will happen in your life. But I want to leave you with this. The strongest source of strength known to mankind, this is a fact, is when a mere human being like you or I, during these difficult days, will have the courage to get down on our knees and ask God for guidance. Then we can overcome all our problems. God bless you, and thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it. Mr. Shen has uh, agreed to take some questions from you. If you have uh, a question for him, he'd like to uh, open the floor for a minute just to ask him a question, and he'll be glad to respond to it. Do we have any? One right here. Understand your question. You mean while you're in college or when you're out? When you graduate? Well, the only thing I can tell you is the experience with us. Let me let me tell you one thing. And I used to, before I got into sports business, I was in what is referred to as proprietary education. And that is like private business schools, and that which really no longer exists now. But uh, I've hired a lot of people, and the number one criteria in my mind for hiring people is a simple word called enthusiasm. I want you to think about that because, it, I mean, it's important for you to have a good education. It's important for you to, you know, have if you've got good grades. All of these things help. But in my opinion, nothing encouraged me more to hire a person than somebody had a great smile that was positive, that did a little homework before they came to find out what's, what's this guy's business all about? What do I want to do? How can I help him? And so I, I'm just explaining to you in my business, and I know a lot of other people, and when I was in the proprietary school business, we used to play students. And when we did that, we would always ask people, and we took surveys on what's the most important thing. And because we, we taught girls how to uh, take shorthand, and they had to be fast at typing, and, and they had to dress right, and all the, all the positive things. But nothing was more important to an employer than somebody that just had, was oozing with confidence. They had a good positive attitude. I think the... Uh, thing to do is just, you know, work with the placement office here and let the uh, institution help, but you do all you can. I mean, now with the internet and everything you can do, uh, I've had people send me t-shirts with a resume on them. And uh, I mean, great idea. There's all kinds of things you can do. And, but what turns me off is when I interview somebody and they come in and they ask me more questions about my business than me asking them about them. You should do your homework before you go. If 
you don't know, ask. See if you can get it on the internet. They got a, if they got a, a website, pull it up and study it. And, and figure out, hey, I can fit here. When you go, just sell yourself. That's the key. I don't know if I answered your question. I, I, I tried, but, but the key is being confident. And so just go at it and believe you can get it done, and it's amazing. And in our business, in particular with the Hornets, some of the key executives we have started off as interns, basically working free. And particularly people in media in areas like that have just started and they they working for getting credit as interns and now they're making more than I am. So the potential's there and I'd be happy to help any way I can, but uh, I'm not hiring right now because Dave's already applied for a job. <laughs> <laughs> any other questions? We have one right here. Aaron? Wow, that's, uh, <laughs> well, I haven't won an NBA championship. I was hoping I could say that, but uh, no, I think that uh, probably being involved in, it gave me the opportunity with the Hornets that people, if, if I go to an event somewhere and I'm a speaker, or if I'm trying to do something, I can get people to help me just because, you know, George Shin, he owns the Hornets. And for instance, example, uh, when we were, after the storm and so many people, homes were flooded and, and uh, we helped uh, rebuild about, how many, 25 or how many homes was it? Okay, 60 some families in homes. And what happened is just because I was associated with the Hornets and it gave me sort of a platform to help others. And that's probably been the most uh, touching. I mean, it's amazing when you see families that are living in tents or they're homeless. I mean, it's terrible and you work with Habitat for Humanity or some of the other groups, and you put up the money because you're able to raise it because you're in a position to do that, and you help these people start their lives over again, it's probably been, that's been the most rewarding. I would rather do that, quite honestly. I might be lying a little bit, but I'd rather do that than win a championship. <laughs> <laughs> like I said, I might be lying just a little bit. We have another question? <clears throat> One right here. this exhibition game and fortunately I think LeBron and Dwayne Wade somebody tripped them on the way into the arena and they wouldn't be able to play them. <laughs> but uh, uh, no I think that uh, uh, you know they got a good team I think Orlando has an outstanding team Boston's still pretty good of course the Lakers uh, Lakers are always going to be strong so uh, it's just uh, you know, we're in that area that we just try to survive and keep keep moving along. We we do give credit for having the best point guard in the NBA, with Chris Paul, and it, the super kid, the super kid. But anyway, no, they're gonna be hard to beat, no question about it. And uh, they pulled a fast one for all of them to get there together, but uh, they had that right. So God bless them. Any other Maybe one more, Adam. More questions. <laughs> no, that was good. Thank you. Adam. <laughs> I think he talked you on that one. Uh, 
Uh, he wanted to know what his chances were to be in the number one uh, lottery pick next year. So uh, uh, I think I've seen you play, have I? Was he, were you here last year? Oh, or yeah. Just, yeah, I, rem I thought I remember him. Pretty cocky dude, yeah. <laughs> No, no, he's right, he's right. He said, you said you gotta be confident. That's the first step, that's the first step. <laughs> and uh, I'll make sure that our GM checks you out, all right? I'll let you know ahead of time so you can really think hard and hang your problems on the trouble tree the night before, all right? <laughs> I love that kind of question, that's great, that's great. You gotta believe. <laughs> Any other questions? Okay, maybe time for, one for another one right here. I don't play basketball, but I serve a hell of a war. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I serve some good I mean, I So you think it could be a oh, good water? Right. Well, water boards make pretty good in the NBA. That's, that's pretty good. Yeah. Yeah, and my wife just reminded me, uh, you know, one thing you might want to do instead of be a water boy is be a mascot. Uh, uh, our mascot uh, makes uh, in the six figures. Uh, I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> No, he's uh, a, a good a good mascot. A good mascot in the NBA makes a lot of money, but they're really good at what they're doing. They're really, really are trained. Of course, they have programs that you can go train to do that, and and there's all kind of possibilities. You got to uh, uh, just like the dude here wants to be a lottery pick and. Uh, a guy would like to be the water boy. You can, there's all kind of possibilities you got to go after. You got to be aggressive. Good luck to all of you. Thank you for having me. We have books in the lobby and uh, two of Mr. Shen's books and tickets to the NBA game. Thank you all for being here tonight. <laughs>